and I've, I'm kind of been interested in quantitative trading and what that's all about. And I'm about halfway through this documentary and they keep, keep saying this name. They keep saying this name. And I'm like, that's so familiar. I feel like I know of this guy. It's the guy that owns Meritage, that oh, owns Columbia. Yeah. I mean, he invented quantitative trading. I had no that's idea. Crazy. This guy's brilliant. I mean, he, you know, he's a mathematician and, and his average return rates like 30% over the last 20 years. No, but it's the best hedge fund in the, in the world ever. Um, better than, you know, Warren Buffett, better than any of those guys. So anyway. Harry, was this thing on Netflix? No, it was just on YouTube. Oh, okay. I was going to say I, Netflix should sponsor our pod because you're I always know. watching. I was watching a Netflix yeah. documentary. I mean, all I have is YouTube and Netflix. So that's, <laughs> and you know, basically you can get pretty much anything on YouTube now that you need. You know, I uh, actually paid for some of uh, athletic beer actually. out in the wild and it's really good. I bought the Chilada. It's a non alk Chilada. And I got to say, you throw a little vodka in there, it's not bad. <laughs> It is the best Bloody Mary. I'm going to go get the can. Jen, why don't you introduce our illustrious guest? A howdy, Bill. Well, today on BeerNet Radio, where all your dreams come true, we have uh, Bill Schufelt, who is co-founder of Athletic Brewing Co. Hey, Bill, how are you? Hey, good, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Um, uh, yeah, our beers definitely serve as anything from standalone to mixer to pacer beer, anything in between. So no right, discouragement of any occasion. <laughs> well, most of your drinkers are uh, alcohol drinkers, right? I mean, you over-index in alcoholic drinkers, right? Not alcoholic drinkers, but alcohol <laughs> yeah. drinkers. Yeah, well, that was the old perception of the category, for sure. But it's, yeah, over 80% of our customers, um, both in, we've surveyed and then we've seen it in Nielsen data too, um, separately. The common thread through the category is a love of beer, not a love of sobriety, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, let me there, give you there a... There it is, folks, ladies and gentlemen. It's good Chalada stuff. Nada. Cheers. I, I always do this before I... Uh, it's just a little trick I learned from August Bush the Third. It's going to be awesome when he opens it and it explodes in his yeah. face. <laughs> is that Chris Can... Finari I see there? Or how's your baby? Is this true you have a baby? Somebody let you have a baby? That's that's <laughs> true. Yeah. How's that? Hey, Chris. You have two? I have one and Bill has one. Together we have two. <laughs> <laughs> there you oh, go. Con That's congratulations, amazing. guys. Let me let me go ahead and give you guys an official introduction. Uh, Athletic Brewing Co. is, one could argue, the hottest brand in craft, right? You guys are only a handful of years old, but you're already doing a couple hundred thousand barrels. I believe the second biggest non-alk uh, beer in the country now. There are some markets where you're number one. Of course, KDB, KDP sorry, took a stake last year worth $50 million. The war chest is much larger. Um, I could go on, but I think that sets the table. So let's start with the newest news, you guys. I mean, last Friday, right before I was about to take my children to the zoo, you tweeted about the new kegs that are going out in just a couple of markets uh, and set the internet to fire. So I'm curious, um, this is obviously a new component for your for your brand. Uh, do you think that can be a meaningful contributor over the next few years? Where, what are you guys thinking about here? Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't mean for that to be big news. That <laughs> picture was just on my iPhone as John and I were walking out the door. It wasn't anything planned. And then two seconds later, I tweeted it in the car. So, um, but it, I think people are, it shows the excitement of the community for what we're working on, expanded distribution and everything. And so, Really, it's it's going to be piloted. We're going to let the community tell us where a draft goes. It's not a huge focus for us in this year, um, but kind of like everything we do, it, we've been working really hard behind the scenes on quality food safety, making sure this is a great program. Um, as everyone knows, non-alcoholic beer doesn't have ethanol. So we've been really thoughtful about every element of our quality and food safety over the life of our company and over-invested in that. And that's credit to John and the quality teams and stuff at our company. Because that's, yeah. I mean, kegs are by nature unpasteurized, right? I don't know. I guess your maybe yours are, but um, if there's no ethanol in there, I would imagine it is harder to keep it fresh out there. Is there a shorter date light on date on it? Yeah, so it's probably a much bigger conversation. And until we pilot and like are farther along in this, I don't want to give like big declaratory advice for the category. So <laughs> yeah, um, okay. John and Zoe are presenting at the Brewers Association uh, in a few weeks down in Nashville, though. Um, you know, we're really trying to 
take a category leadership stance and like just always teaching the craft community and the non-alcoholic community like what we've learned along the way to pull this category forward in the in a safe way. Uh, we saw each other a couple weeks ago because you guys were down here for South by and we were talking about like this year's dry January, right? And I think you mentioned that this was your best January to date, but obviously you do most of your uh, volume during the summer. So what can you yeah. share for, you know, how 2023 is shaping up for you guys? Can you expect another record breaking year, right? A- any news you want to break on our pod today? <laughs> sure, we definitely can. Um, I'm pretty much an open book. I'm dying for you guys to get up to the Connecticut Brewery at some point and do yes. a podcast up there because it's, I mean, it's super easy for me to be like the guy reporting the news for our company, but like there are 200 incredible people in our company that are so much more talented, but I'd love you guys to see the inside of our breweries and how advanced they are Um, because the team is so talented. But yeah, I mean, maybe it makes sense to start on 2022. Um, Just like, I feel like the perception of non-alcoholic beer is still this like very niche category. And if you kind of blink and don't pay attention for six to 12 months, it's I think a more meaningful driver to beer category growth um, than it ever has been. 2022 was a year of definitely continued adoption. We brought on our big new brewery in Connecticut. So we have the two big bi-coastal breweries and we were finally able to say yes to more of our middle tier partners and third tier partners and retailers who had wanted our beer for a while. Um, And we just felt we were at a point to service them better and, um, you know, credit to a lot of these big retail buyers too, who are really looking at the data and giving merit-based opportunity to brands that are selling a lot of beer and servicing them well. And so we are seeing non-alcoholic beer going into the cold box more than ever for the year ahead. Um, but I guess, sorry, I said I was going to start on 22 and I talked about 23. Um, but um, yeah, we we ended up shipping about 170,000 barrels last year. Um, Athletic is uh, non-alcoholic beer as a category um, since call it the middle of last year, like week 26, has been accelerating every month as a category off a bigger base uh, for about nine months now. The category is now growing about 36 or 37 percent in the off premise Um, off a pretty big base, you know, just past two percent of all grocery sales in a lot of the natural channel that's out in front of how fast they adopted the. Uh, non-alcoholic space, non-alcoholic beer is eight to 10% of beer sales in a lot of those retailers um, and growing pretty quickly. Um, And they were starting to see run wild. Like if we like go from like just non-alcoholic beer to craft beer in terms of just broader IPAs, like run wild and free wave are moving into the top 20, top 15 IPAs. They're both top 10 growth IPAs year to date. Free Wave is the number two hazy IPA in growth year to date. Um, and Upside Dawn is the number two golden ale in the country behind uh, just Kona's Big Wave, um, but the number one growth golden ale as well. That's crazy. So, but when does the, I mean, you guys have been growing exponentially for years. You're basically a little over five years old and you're a top 25 craft brewer, right? So do you expect to grow exponentially again this year? And when does growth finally kind of moderate in your plans? You know, we're, we're not really that growth focused we're letting the community really pull our beer where it wants to go and trying to be good partners um we did sell more beer last year than all prior years combined um so it's great getting the breweries online and um the spring reset period in 23 will be our biggest um by a wide margin ever as we see some of these really strong retail buyers really lean into the category um we're seeing both cold and warm sets in the category for the first time in a big way in a lot of different places. So, so spring, spring resets were looking good for you probably. You know, when when you started bill and I probably have asked you this, but did you think in five years you'd be selling 175,000 barrels? Is that part of the plan? Because that seems really ambitious and, you know, kudos on you for doing it. But I have to say, I did not think that you were going to sell 175,000. I, I would say you guys were like way out in front and listening to us at least and giving me a, a forum of sharing delirious thoughts, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, it wasn't that far long ago when, I think it was like 18 months ago when we were talking about non-alcoholic beer being 10, 20% of the beer category. Um, and that got like universally torn apart. Um, <laughs> and there were people like yourselves who are open-minded to that someday just because like my logic has always been that 
people are not drinking alcohol most of the time. Like most people, most hours of the day are not consuming alcohol. And those occasions are great. They've been drinking alcohol for 5,000 years and people will always drink alcohol. We want to give people great beer they can drink every day of the week. And just logic says there are tons of those occasions. Um, and it was just very underserved. Um, so, um, you know, we didn't have specific numbers, but I think the logic was definitely there. So kind of going back to that 10 to 20%, you know, we saw, we see natural channel being out in front, getting to eight to 10% of beer sales in dry January, which I know is an incredibly favorable comp for athletic. It's seasonally receptive and we can get displays, um, like a large na national grocery channel, uh, non or sorry, for a large national grocer, non-alcoholic beer was over 15% of national beer sales during the month of January. Wow. In our strongest region of the Northeast, in the strongest week of January, in that grocer, we were uh, non-alcoholic beer was 26% of all beer sales. Um, so Good it Lord. is January, but that's a big number. And it, I mean, that, that, is, that, that stat right there is amazing because you have to believe that I can't read an article about alcohol lately that really is the, the narrative right now is going toward with young people, especially is the only good amount of alcohol is no alcohol. I'll give you a, a quick anecdote because this is, this podcast is really just a, a medium for me to just <laughs> tell personal anecdotes because I don't have many friends. And so I, I went, we, I have a poker club that I've been in for 30 years. And uh, we meet months a month, and we went to this. You know, it's just a bunch of old men like me. And uh, I went, and I, 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 uh, I've been, uh, I haven't been drinking since like last June. That somebody's like, "Hey, I got you a six pack of non-alcohol beer," you know, <laughs> you know. And it was athletic. I'm like, oh, thanks. And I had one, and then everybody else wanted to have one, and they're like, "Hey, this is pretty good." And then they all drank my six pack, and I only got one. So you know, <laughs> it, you know, if for a bunch of old drunks to really go, "Wow, this is good," I might pick it up. You know, I would. That, that's something that when you get the old men drinking it, then you know maybe you've hit rock bottom or you're really hitting the mainstream. So uh, that's the end of my anecdote, and I'm gonna. Uh, I'll try and keep it to only two or three more <laughs> but that that is like exactly what it's all about it's like someone who loves beer but doesn't want to drink in that occasion for like any zillion reasons and you can have a great beer and like athletic like non-alcoholic beer was never about the love of beer before and with someone like john and our really talented teams like athletic is about the love of great beer like that you can just have at other times also without like judgments and we saw that your conference in Florida, um, you know, at those bars every day, Alex and I were restocking on the fly from Total Wine nice. in Florida because like it was the fastest moving products at a beer industry event. Like people who maybe normally would have had one alcoholic drink at a work event and behave themselves could have three or four drinks, you know, and Athletic and Heineken Zero and everything meets that occasion. Well, yeah. you know, this chilada, like I said, I what I do is I pour it in a glass over ice and then I put non alcoholic vodka in it. And it's a <laughs> non alcoholic bloody mark. It's delicious. I'm just Are kidding. you serious? I believe you're no, lying. Harry. No, of course. Yeah. I will say uh, overall non alcoholic category velocity. So even talking outside of beer now, like I'm obviously like live in my echo chamber of non alcoholic beer, but the the velocities across the category have been really strong and we're seeing retailers lean into separate standalone shelves that are cross category, non-alcoholic beer or non-alcoholic categories, uh, beer, wine, spirits, RTDs. And I'm really excited to see how those go this year. Many of the same retailers are doing like, um, a second cold box that is non-alcoholic beer also though. It's great to see non-alcoholic beer go into the cold box because it was really warm only up until very recently. So that's definitely like a merit-based philosophy thing. I wanted to ask a little bit about competition entrance and how the space uh, shelf is set up right now. You know, it seems like your biggest competition are line extensions. And I'm wondering, there's another one coming this year with Corona. How many more of these do you expect to duke it out with? I don't view it as duking it out at all, honestly. Like I am equally likely to be pitching other people's products as our own along like flanking ours on a shelf. And, you know, five years ago, there wasn't like a single name brand in the category. Um, and now you have many of the most popular flagship beers in the world have a 
non-alcoholic version. Um, so Athletic is super excited to be there on the shelf, but you have Heineken, Guinness, Corona, Bud, uh, Peroni, Stella. So it's it's a really cool shelf as you open up menus these days and everything. Um, even with all that, so there are all those flagship mega brands, and then there's over 100 craft non-alcoholic brands in the category too. Over 80% of the growth is coming from a very concentrated set of like four SKUs. So it's focusing on the core is definitely important, but we're viewing it as a rising tide where, you know, if, okay. if this category is going to grow 20 to 40% for 10 more years and be a huge percentage of occasions, like that is a lot of occasions to meet. And we want every beer people grab on that shelf to be a great example of what non-alcoholic beer could be. And it's heading that direction. So um, I, I, I thought that's what you might say, but I had to ask just, you know, just to see if, go ahead. I do have one pretty, so like at retail in 23, like the cold box has been a very big trend we're seeing coming now and more channels are opening to non-alcoholic beer where, you know, the bigger grocers leaning in, the natural channel grocers have done an awesome job. Uh, Whole Foods, Sprouts, Trader Joe's, Wegmans, like adopted really early, Total Wine adopted super early. And as soon as we're ready to be great partners, Walmart, Kroger, Target are leaning in in a big way now. Um, and to set in the drug chain, seeing CVS and Rite Aid lean in, and, but like convenience still is pretty underdeveloped. Um, yeah. I will say the other big trend we're seeing now, um, the category is very import heavy. Um, and in this economy, in this environment, people really want to see people providing U.S. jobs. And like Athletic is a domestically produced beer. We provide hundreds of manufacturing jobs. Almost the entire category is either import or contract manufactured. And so retailers have really been um, that like the investment we've made in this category, our facilities, our people, our markets, like has really been resonating with retailers. Well, with imports, craft, you know, premium, domestic premium, and even kind of like beyond beer with hoppy water and all that. Have you seen retailers start to categorize the non-alc shelf space in a certain way? Because it's kind of resembling total beer. I mean, with all the yeah. different segments, or is it still just kind of here's all the non-alc in one little or one bigger spot now? There's a lot of different approaches and I'm excited to see how the data shakes out this year. Um, I think this is a year where there's a lot more innovation in the sets taking place and there are different approaches. So it'll be really interesting to see how that data shakes out as, as distribution is getting better around the country as well. Um, and but just the opposite too. We are, we are seeing very little to almost no non-alcoholic innovation in some sets as well. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a quick follow-up to something you just mentioned, you know, you said there's a lot of new craft entrants. Do you expect like a mini version of the larger craft industry to start coming to fruition in non out Cause it is so hot and it is so resonant with craft drinkers. I mean, are there hundreds of more waiting in the wings? Hey, we hope so. As long as it's done thoughtfully and safe and with quality. Um, John and the team have really been trying to take an industry leadership position there where, you know, I'm the chairman of ANBA, the Adult Non-Alcoholic Beverage Association. John and Zoe, who runs regulatory and food safety for us, are doing a big presentation at uh, the BA conference in six weeks um, about just like how to do this well and safe, like what lessons have we learned along the way? And it, it's not easy. Uh, unfortunately, they're like getting a fully compliant food safety program for a single SKU edition is probably not a reality for a lot of craft brewers, mm -hmm. especially in this economic environment. Um, even the smallest tunnel pasteurizers are probably five hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. plus. Mm -hmm. Like the space is a cost in itself, mm -hmm. plus like installation, and so there there are some real hurdles to doing it well. Um, and then it's like the time and the focus where, um, so I, I, I think the barriers are a lot higher, unfortunately, than to traditional. Unfortunately, it sounds like a nice moat <laughs> for you, right? <laughs> you know, don't venture capitalists always talk about moats for those of us who are around, like in the late nineties, you know, craft went through this rapid expansion and it was all hyped up. And then it kind of hit a, a, a plateau, if you will, mainly because people were, a lot of people were putting out bad beer. And, and I think maybe that's one of the tangents you're kind of getting at is, yeah, we welcome it, 
but we don't we don't want bad beer out there because it really could hurt the category. Is that is that right? It's got to be good beer. It's got to be things people take a lot of pride in. Um, unfortunately, if you have a product that's not better in quality than the category used to be, it's mm-hmm. just spruced up with light marketing. Like that's not much different than what the category used to be. We've invested a ton in our quality, in our facilities, in our people, and in our marketing. And I think the category has to be truly different for the future results to be different. Um, so. I'm curious about the marketing, because I know, obviously, we talked about the big investment from KDP. Uh, when can we see like national TV commercials, right? We're still staying pretty nimble. I mean, we're investing a lot in marketing. Um, you know, it's every other beverage category is marketing to the craft beer consumer. Like, we've got a market to them also to like grow this category. Um, probably something craft beer under indexes in a lot. Um, so we are very much keeping true to like what how we've grown the brand always like i am still handing out beers going to races uh chris and i were at south by southwest last week giving out beer on the street like um we activated probably 2500 events last year in person like the best way to teach people on that non-alcoholic beer is still to put a beer in their hand and talk to them about it um and but we are trying to drive through to more general awareness also and so we did our campaign with JJ Watt and David Chang and our fit for fit for all times is that kind of enduring marketing message that expands the occasion of our category, but we will have a new campaign rolling out this spring and summer season for peak beer season. Was it a digital or? It was a little of everything. Um, obviously we have to be pretty nimble with how we uh, buy TV, but um, we did advertise with like NFL playoff football um college football playoffs and uh football we're doing some stuff regionally in march madness as well so okay cool cool Um, so well let's back up a little bit because obviously i keep coming back to that big kdp investment right but it's it's big news and it validates the category a lot Um, I'm, i'm curious i mean are they a little more involved than some of your other investors obviously they have a board seat um what can you share about that yeah um i mean a lot of people always like look at the dollars we've raised, but like when you come to our facilities, you realize like where the dollars go. It's like, we are building a totally different differentiated quality foundation and kind of hopefully the rails of the category in the future. Um, So it's um, yeah, we are investing like adequately in marketing and stuff, but we are building big facilities. Um, KDP has been just as advertised, you know, a reason we took investment from them was the people and Like they've been great collaborators and um, it's still just a build and learn partnership. Um, So we've, it, it is like, I guess it's as much as we make of it, it could be. Um, So, you know, when we have any questions, we are picking up the phone a lot. Like what's the point of having like someone you can ask questions to if you don't ask them questions. And so um, really good people, good collaborators that we've asked a lot of questions to, but um hasn't really changed anything about how we do business or anything like that. We're going to have you on a year from now. I'm going to ask, do you regret going into draft? <laughs> because it's a logistical fuck, fuck, fuck shit show. And <laughs> not a draft fuck show, is, not a shit show. Not a, it's fuck a fuck shit, shit show. show. It's, it's both because, you know, the kegs have to come back. And I realize there's logistics. You probably use, you know, microstar or something but it is a different uh, a ball game is, is this a, a is this a big thing for y'all or is it more of a pilot test see what what happens it's gonna be community driven so um you know our main investments and focuses this year are on our big partners uh, both in the middle and the third tier and like making sure that business is a success and um just as you guys know the logistics and supply chain around growing a business that is like variably in the double to triple digits fluctuations, uh, especially with 10% inflation and growing interest rates and stuff. So um, we're really focused on just growing our existing businesses, innovating around the fringes, like seeing where the community pulls, things like that. Um, But really just, uh, you know, building a sustainable long-term business in a very uncertain economic environment. So. We've had a pretty, and, I, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just, I just know that it's, it's a, it's just a pain. 
You know, I remember yeah. when Constellation did it, and they, you know, I remember Bill Hackett just being like, "Good God Almighty, the, the, they come back! It comes back to you." Yeah, I mean, I've I've self distributed hundreds of kegs to bars that we have good relationships with, and like testing things out, and um, you know, just in the past few weeks, I've had over probably 25, 30 drafts at different places around New York and San Diego. And it's been a blast. It's, oh. it's great to walk in see the tap handle, talk to the bartenders. Um, self district. So, you mean you're, you, these kegs are heavy. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but oh, um, sorry, this is historically back in like 2018 and 19 oh, with okay. the knowledge of our distributors. We were just you. like, being like, Hey, we're, we're trialing this. We're testing this. Um, I got you. And, we took a hiatus from COVID and then to work on the food safety of broader distribution of eggs. So, um, Hey Bill, I'm, I'm, wor- I'm not worried. I'm wor- wondering, sorry, <laughs> you were just talking about, you know, the kind of year it is, right. We're all kind of, uh, wondering what's going to happen with the economy. So what keeps you up at night, you know, this year? I mean, we're, um, we're within two months of our five year anniversary of launching. Um, and, we pretty much haven't had a normal year yet. Um, I remember everyone talking about 2019 as the craziest year that ever happened. And um, so it's, I, I will say we just have such a great team that, um, you know, it's far so far beyond the capabilities of me and John. Um, we've just been super lucky to get great talent inside our walls. Um, yeah, it is like broader quality of product and marketing in the category uh, is definitely one. Um, it's the, the health of the consumer across the country. Um, I think uh, we're really lucky to be selling an affordable luxury. Um, I think big ticket items are falling off a cliff. Um, but, you know, if you have a tough work day, a beer of any kind, alcoholic or non-alcoholic, is still a very affordable luxury, thank goodness. And, um, but we are, Athletic pushed back really hard on that second price hike last year. And we went up in very few places in the country. And we we're super vocal about that. And our retailers have really appreciated that. And we don't intend to go up um, right now in the near term either. Um, I think real-time deflation is much lower than reported. And um, so, but the health of the consumer is one. Interest rates are one. Um, I worry about the industry. It's very debt heavy. Interest rates have skyrocketed. So it's not a great time to be refinancing. Did you have any exposure to the Silicon Valley or any of these other bank issues? I think everyone has exposure to it in some way. People just don't realize yet. You know, there are 33 million small businesses who mostly bank at regional banks. Uh, Athletic, we're very fortunate with our investor team and um, where we bank and our stability. Um, But uh, I I think even if you feel super secure where you bank, like whistling, like in the, like, like having your head in the sand about any risks in this economy, I don't think is wise. Like we're as a management team, always like poking holes in our business, ensuring our supply chain, hedging and things like that. So I just heard a podcast this morning that it's going to take at least 2 trillion to backstop not only their T bill timing issue of these long treasuries, but also the, the commercial real estate that they own, which are all underwater. I mean, with 20, 30% vacancy rates, my son, poor guy is starting his career in commercial brokering commercial real estate. <laughs> Luckily he's in Austin, but uh all right, so that that's my last anecdote. Sorry about that guys. <laughs> Are um, you sure? No, nope, let me see how many so much of the economy is driven by the by the lending that happens at a regional level. And I'm really yeah. scared about what that contraction looks like for the economy and jobs and um so uh yeah I would say that kind of stuff keeps me up most at night. Um I, our athletic team in general is having a lot of fun working on the problems that develop in a growing business. You know, there's never a dull day. There's like three peaks, four valleys or four peaks, three <laughs> valleys, depending on the day. And we have a great group of people we're tackling these with. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm getting too much in the weeds here, Bill, but, but let's say a full blown recession does happen. Do you then see you guys accelerating or decelerating as that affordable luxury that's non alk I, I don't think anything accelerates in a really bad yeah. uh, economy. So um, we're just going about our business responsibly, like being attainable on price for the category, not taking too much price mm-hmm. and um, just growing a really stable, profitable business. So. Yeah. Oh, I think holding on that pi- that price, the price hike is, is really smart. Not that I know anything, but um, 
you know, as I look back, that's really when Corona took off. I mean, if you want to look at, you know, Corona was a declining brand until 92 when they ate the excise tax price increase and everybody else passed it on. And you just look at the trend line, it just reversed that year and it's never stopped since then. And it was just because they recalibrated that price gap between it and Bud Light, basically. We kind of categorize price gaps between our little categories, you know, domestic premium, imports, sub premium. Well, the consumer, it's more nebulous, I think. Uh, I, I think that um, when you look at by prices against Bud Light as kind of the gold standard, I think that's it's not a good metric to base anything off anymore. I think it's more of uh, the consumers just thinking of just a, 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 a much more narrow stable of what they're willing to buy, and the price gaps between that that narrow uh, stable is what is what matters rather than just banking on everything off Bud Light. I, again, another speech. Sorry, I'm just rolling today. But Corona is pretty good marketing, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In all weather, no matter what like happens ahead in the economy, we are committed to always responsibly invest in marketing behind our core brands and like consistently tell those messages and then always have people in the markets we do business too. Um, so we're not just like sending beer anywhere and hope it goes well. Like we, visit everywhere and have people almost everywhere so yeah that's a nice hedge for for having pricing power i would say yeah it looks like you guys have a lot of brand equity just brand equity is just it's just money in the bank it's just a a wonderful beautiful thing and uh you guys have nailed it i think it's all because of chris Fenari. he's a he's a wizard he'll set the thing in motion before i uh <laughs> I, I could even imagine what a non-alcoholic beer would taste like. He was but working Chris, on this years it ago. Really, you got to be honest, though, it really took off when you joined. I mean, if you just, <laughs> the numbers don't lie. <laughs> Jordan, I know you're by you. You're, I mean, I had a question earlier, and it was just about, you know, the recent collab with Super Brew or Super Coffee, and that is targeted towards a specific occasion, you know, with a, a pre-workout brew. Do you see yourself targeting more kind of specific occasions than just broader drinking occasions with athletic because you have that ability? Yeah, that was definitely just meant to be a fun collaboration. Right. Like as an actual pre-workout brew, that was something like it, it was mostly joking. Um, but like, well, I've seen actual alcoholic pre-workout brews. That. Oh, yeah. Yeah. and there was somebody and that did it jersey <laughs> oh, of course jersey yeah <laughs> and we have maybe it was our, yeah we have people who drink our beers like before after workouts really random places like every morning in the shower like um and yeah i i would say so like that is meant to be fun like i'm good friends with the super coffee team we've been kind of like on the same entrepreneurial journey and we do collaborate and have fun with other brands we admire, like Laird Hamilton um, the past two years. And we have some other fun stuff coming up this year. Um, and so really just meant to be fun, but there is like a trial and innovation insight in there, like leaning into the more functional. And um, I will say we have like all sorts of secret experiments going on and like innovation. And we launched 50 beers on e-commerce last year. It's like kind of where we trial all our innovation so we yeah. can bring a, like super focused, well executed lineup to retail and distribution. And it just it takes every bone in my body of discipline to like not <laughs> keep those secret. do more innovation. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's like um, with pre workout, there's no such thing as irony because he, he, all the every pre workout brand name I've seen I thought was ironic. And then I find out it's not, you know, it's like, you know, Smash Brothers or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Mario. Like a, it sounds like a gaming fuel brand. Yeah, that's what I said. But well, um, if it's not, it should be. Uh, well, I can't wait for the collaboration with Laird because Laird is the man. But oh, well, we've you... already launched that. I still have a few left in my fridge if you want to try it. But oh, okay, um, yeah, there are people who didn't get the pre-workout joke at all too. I will <laughs> say. It's like, do I do I have to respond to? Them? Yeah. yeah. Do you uh? Do you feel like you need to target specific occasions or from your research or whatever data, you know, you have on hand, does it seem like people are drinking them, you know, all throughout the day? 
or is it still kind of mainly in these after work social settings yeah i mean i like i'm very much like the original customer of athletic brewing too like i had no intention of doing this ever it's just i like wanted this so badly um i i almost unintentionally drink three beers a day every day and those are totally new drinking occasions that i never had in my life and so i I think there is a lot of unlock out there um yeah our focus isn't really like finding a new niche occasion right now like our awareness is still so low like unaided awareness for athletic brewing has to be below five percent like if you ask people to write it in a line on the paper and then distribution is still super low too um run wild is even though it's like a like very highly ranked ipa now it's still uh 30 percent or below distribution and um all of our other SKUs are way below 20 percent distribution so um but that's despite in the last two years so not just in craft just all brands of all sizes athletic brewing has been a top 10 dollar growth driver including all those and we're number six over the last two years um in terms of all dollar growth and it's just some big brands ahead of us so it sounds like you have a lot of run room, run runway. I mean, just to distribution in, in markets that you're already, you know, even with the probably in your deepest distribution markets, you're still way below Sam Adams or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh one of the biggest retailers in the Northeast just took us in for the first time, uh, any SKUs. And even in that region where we've been in business almost five years, we're growing above fifty percent in every state in the Northeast. Um and then some other regions, um, like the West, which is a huge commercial region for us, we're growing over 100%. And uh, places where we've more recently launched distribution and are more underpenetrated in the bigger chains, like the Southeast, um, you know, I think we're growing like 580% year over year, year to date down there. What about the Midwest? I'd be curious if they seem like they'd probably be the last to embrace non alcoholic beer. Like, Wisconsin. Do oh, you yeah. sell any <laughs> any in Wisconsin? I mean, Appalachia. Um, yeah, huge amounts in Wisconsin, Minnesota, yeah. a lot of Midwest places. Because uh, they're beer affinity. drinkers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's they like recognize that immediately. Um, Minnesota, like, has always been a really strong per capita region for us. Um, mm. In some cities where you think we would be doing well, we're, we're definitely lagging nationally. Um, but, um, yeah, we're excited to have room to grow there. Harry, well, don't is- forget JJ Watt is from Wisconsin. So, oh, there you go. Uh, ah, okay. Chris would bring that up, the jock. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm curious uh, what about the hoppy water trend, right? You guys have a hoppy water, and that's hot right now, too. Is that potentially even bigger than non out beer, or how do you guys look at that? It is. You know, it's in that innovation space. So we're going to see like how hard the community pulls it. Um, Daypack has had really little focus and commercialization from us. Um, you know, it hasn't had the big investment. We're super focused on the core. And mm-hmm. this spring is the first national placement it's going to be rolling out to. So it'll be exciting to see how that works at retail. Um, and it hasn't had a ton of support. I will say where, so it's just been kind of living on our e-commerce site and over, so over 20% of our subscribers, uh, so double digit thousands of people, um, have included Daypack in their monthly subscription. So um, okay. it's very organically fallen into the lives of different people in different day parts. Speaking candidly, I think it's it's very to be seen. Do beer customers and alcohol purchasers want a water in the beer mm-hmm. set? Um, mm-hmm. I would say our insight that we've gotten from customers and researched over time is that like hoppy waters probably belong in the water aisle and water customers are looking for it next to water, not beer, right. but yeah, um, that's what we've seen so far from I, consumer insights, but we'll see how it goes in the beer set. That makes sense. And as you're saying this, and I know how much you guys get in terms of insights from e-commerce, like what are the couple of like working models you have of who your composite consumer is? I'm sure it's not just one. I'm sure you've got a couple, right? since we started, it's gone towards more 50, 50 male, female and younger and younger, like, you know, these millennials, Xennials, Gen Z kind of grew up without the stigmas that a lot of us grew up with about the category. And Mm -hmm. so, um, it is a very easy, low friction choice as long as it's uh, like visibly available at places. So 
Um, and yeah, the consumer uh, demographic shift has, you know, athletes, busy professionals, parents, um, but it's really going more and more mainstream on different occasions. So not older people, not, not people like not distinguished gentlemen, like of Harry's ill. It, it's not to say less of that at all. It's just, that's where the traditional category yeah. was. It's just yeah. opened up to way more populations than it ever has. So. How about yeah. that world cup? That was uh that had to have been good news. I would think for you guys that, uh, I mean, non out, uh, I know that just a lot of old people that are my friends, <laughs> didn't know that non alk beer was kind of a thing until the World Cup and AB had to very publicly put Bud Zero everywhere. And uh, I was like, you know, that's a, just a big ad for non alk beer. I think Bill Shufield would probably be happy about that. I am very much in the category building mindset. Like I, I very often recommend when I'm walking to a bar, like, yes, athletic skew or two is great here, but you should also have a Heineken and a Bud next to it or a Guinness next to it or something. But like anywhere people are spending big dollars on non-alcoholic beer, like, yes, please, advertising, like, yes, please. So whether that's World Cup, F1, the Super Bowl, like, thank goodness people are talking about non-alcoholic beer in these places. And for us not to have to pay to do that, like we can spend money <laughs> elsewhere is great. Well, I, you know, I'd say that I'm bullish. <laughs> I mean, you got to be, you got to be really happy with where you're, where you guys are sitting, Bill. I mean, um, just, just the, to me as an outsider looking in, just the distribution numbers alone mean you have a, a lot of room for growth and it's just like picking up dimes off the floor. Yeah, That's there's, a, I mean, very little stibbing being done on our team. It's like, we're really excited about the opportunity. Like there's a chance to talk to the country about this exciting space right now. We can either take advantage of the opportunity or not. And our team's all about taking advantage of that moment. And we're running as hard as ever for sure. And um, at times inside our walls, it doesn't necessarily feel like winning. Like we are really committed to excellence in all areas of our business. So. You um, made a category. I, I made a TikTok a few months ago. Sometimes I TikTok from my hot tub. I call it hot tubbing with Harry. I don't really call it that. But um, I said uh, something that's like that. That's why it's that. getting banned. Yeah, that, that's why it's getting banned. It's a hot banned. tubbing with Harry. All right. I didn't know clothes were optional. But yeah, I was, I was like, you know, Bill Schufel created a category, a whole category for nothing. I go, somebody's going to fuck it up, and it's probably going to be A.B., and I, I made that tongue in cheek because any new category that's growing historically, AB comes in and fucks it up. Uh, I don't know what the point of that was. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, the category is in a very exciting, like merit based stage where like our partners in the middle tier are doing a great job representing a high velocity brand and getting us out to shelves and fulfilling all these chain commitments is not easy for sure um, yeah. across the country and um, and retailers like just being objective about what's on the set, paying attention to who's gaining and losing share. And um, right. so it, like throwing it in the cold box in a lot of places across the country is a big statement for sure. Uh, I mean, it, it's a game changer, right? It seems like a no brainer. One, one quick follow up. You're talking about the cold box a bunch. You guys don't have large format singles, right? Uh, not yet. Okay. Um, it's showing up in certain places like venues and stuff. Well, I, I'd like to give a shout out to Chris Fernari, who keeps Harry versus Wild alive. <laughs> it's 15 years old, I think. And about every year, Fernari just throws out a tweet and says, don't forget. <laughs> and, you know, I haven't looked at it in a while. I'm surprised YouTube hasn't banned it. It has some problematic issues in it. Keep in mind, it was 15 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, it's still worth the watch. It's still yeah. worth the watch. It was before its time. It was before Logan Paul was even out of high school. You know, you're like the original Burt Kreischer. Well, I don't know who that is, but thank you. He's the guy that takes his shirt off. He's a stand up comedian. Oh, oh, yeah. It's not yeah. a compliment, Harry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it most certainly is. I, I'll still take it as one. Doesn't matter. Chris is a like a great example of someone who's like super talented and joined our team and saw the potential in it really early on. And like we're really thankful for people like Chris and then people have come from inexplicably large breweries to help grow our team. And so we're super talented for all, or super thankful for all the talented teammates who joined up with us. All right, guys. Well, listen, I want to wish you guys 
a happy and fun weekend that we're about to embark on. I hope you have many athletics and whatever else you enjoy. Thank Thanks you, for having us. Come see the brewery. Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah. I actually would like to. And, all right. and Harry, at the risk of scaring away all of our Gen Z uh, customers, you know, you let us know if you ever need beer for your poker tournament. Okay. No, I buy all my own beer because I think my UPS guy is about to just just vandalize <laughs> my windows. But all right, guys, we'll take care and have a good one. Cheers. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Thanks. Thanks.